We thank you that through his suffering, the sacrifice of him on that cross, that we have eternal life with you, God. Give us a perspective, an eternal perspective on our lives this night, Lord, that we would value and treasure the knowledge of you and who you are, that we can learn and desire to grow in our, in our wisdom and understanding. We pray that you would illuminate our minds and lighten us this night, Father, of, of who your Son, Jesus Christ, is and what he has done. We thank you, Lord. Just pray that you would take us, lead us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, tonight, we're going to begin the topic of Christology, or the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the theme from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ. We all, we all, as Christians, and many of us have been Christians for quite a while, we go, oh yes, Jesus Christ, born a virgin, of a virgin, born, uh, died on a cross, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, he's going to come back, and we believe that in our hearts. We know that. We, we seem to lose some of the edge. We seem to lose some of our zeal, excitement, that, that this man being the object of, this the centerpiece of history, um, the adorable person of Christ, and, and the, the incomprehensible achievements that through his work on the cross, that he had victory over a, re, a universe in rebellion. He conquered sin. And the work of our God at the hand of Jesus Christ and in the presence of people on this planet, while he healed the sick, and while he, while he himself would raise the dead, yet he was thrown into the hands of men that's nailed him to the cross. While he, he, could, he offered eternal life in wells of living water that would spring up in us, he thirsted. He hungered. And how this man, Jesus Christ, could also be God at the same time. In the Bible, there's no other subject given more complete revelation. You'll find that as we go through this class, we'll be going through the Old and New Testament, tying in portions of Scripture from both sides to try to, to knit together um, a theology or a doctrine on Christ himself. We also are, through our past work, those of you that were, how many of you were in the Doctrine of God class? How many of you had not taken the Doctrine of God class? Okay. Well, a lot of things such as the Trinity, the existence of God, and the attributes of God, um, I'm not going to reiterate. I'm not going to reteach them uh, to a very de deep degree. Uh, I encourage you to get the tapes if you don't understand, you know, if you, if you want to know more about these certain parts. But I will clarify what I'm talking about as we get along, but not, not in the depth that we did in the Doctrine of God. It's things like the Trinity and stuff to take time, and uh, we elaborated that in the last class. We're also, I think all of us here being Bible-believing Christians, but I'll just make a statement, we're going to approach this as the Bible being the infallible, inerrant Word of God. And so, when we use the Bible, we're using it as an absolute source of truth. Um, if anybody has a problem with the Bible and inerrancy, which I don't think, but there might be somebody watching the tapes someday, uh, we cover that in bibliology, and that's an exhaustive study in itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to take facts from Scripture and organize them into a theological statement. We're going to take different attributes, the name, we're going to go through and basically cover the deity of Christ, the person of Christ and the work of Christ. I'd like to read a quote from uh, a man named Schaefer, Lewis Berry Schaefer, as he begins the topic of Christology. He says, and I want you to listen because he pairs this off really well. It's, 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 an, it's really neat. He says, of this, of this incomprehensible one it is said that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Yet such a one, who thus occupied the highest place of deity in company with the Father and the Spirit, was made flesh and dwelt among us. 
who is from everlasting to everlasting, was born of a woman and died on a cross, who according to the mind of the Spirit is wonderful, was spit on upon by men, who by the same mind is counselor, is rejected of men, who is the mighty God, is crucified in abject weakness. He, who the everlasting Father, is the Son who learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He who is the Prince of Peace must himself tread the winepress of fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God, of the day of vengeance, must yet be in, in his heart. And he must yet break the nation with a rod of iron and dash it to pieces as the potter's vessel. He who said, I am among you, as he that serveth, said, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. He who is chaste, woeing, lover of the, of the cantisils, is the king of glory, who is mighty in battle. He who created all things occupied an infant's cradle. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, was made to be sin in our behalf. He who is the bread of life was himself hungry. He was the giver of spiritual water of life, himself thirsty. He who was God's gift of life to the lost world was himself dead. He who was dead was a life forevermore. Paradoxes. It almost seems like paradoxes. The life of Christ and, and his work, and we see that, you know, it's still what Jesus Christ did in his life and who he was to the natural mind are not going to tie together. It just doesn't seem to relate. How can a man be God? How can God be man? And as we go through this, there's important things. We're never going to be able to totally understand. And God did not call us to understand him. God has given us enough knowledge and information to formulate, to have an intelligent faith. Christianity is not blind faith. It is an intelligent faith. And we have the obligation before God and our brothers and sisters and the world to learn as much as we possibly can of our God. Because, you see, all, all the other religions are ignorant of their God. They don't know who their God is. And our God has revealed himself. And too many times in the Christian realm, even what we would call, quote, quote, strong Christians, we don't know our God. If I were to come up to you on the street and say, how do you know Jesus Christ is God? Show me where it says Jesus Christ is God. Could you open your Bible and show me? Could you show the simple, a simple person on the street who didn't have some big theological understanding or didn't go to Bible studies, could you show them how Jesus Christ said he was God and make it plain to them? You understand it that well. That's what we want to do in this class. We're not, we're not here to, to gain some great head knowledge to where, oh, yes, I'm, I'm real smart. I know a lot. We're here to learn things and to reinforce things that you may already know. You may be sitting here in this class going, well, I already know. You know, Jesus Christ was a man. I already know that Jesus Christ was God, and I know what he did. But, you know, there's going to be things that you'll hear that are new, and there's also going to be things you're going to hear that you've heard before. Use them as reinforcement, and build. Build on your foundation of knowledge that you already have. Because it's really important, because we need to know our God, and we need to be ready to make a defense for the gospel to whosoever would ask of us. So, as we enter into this, I encourage us to really apply ourselves. We're going to start dealing with the deity of Christ, and that's the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Now, the first topic we'll cover is his eternal pre-existence. Now, Wolbert stated, and I can see his point, that this is the most important area in the doctrine of Christ as a whole, because if Christ is not eternal, he's a creature. If Christ is not eternal, he is a creature and lacks the quality of eternity and infinity, which, character, which are characteristic of God. If Jesus Christ is not eternal, now we know, maybe you don't know, the Jehovah Witnesses say he's a created being, and many other off, offshoots say that Jesus Christ was just a created being, he is not the eternal. They'll say he was pre-existent. Uh, that's why I qualify this with eternal preexistence. They say, yes, he existed before, but as a creature. But that means he is not eternal. That is necessary for God to be God. God has to be an eternal God. All the attributes of God are, are incorporate his eternity infinity, such as God's goodness. God's goodness is eternal. 
It's forever. It never ends. And it's infinite. It's huge. It's expansive. It, it, it has no bounds. And see if God wasn't, didn't have that nature, if God wasn't eternal, if these attributes were not eternal, then God would be mad today, would love us today, and not hate us tomorrow. We would never know. We wouldn't have the assurance of a good God. So these, and as we build this, as we apply these, these attributes of God to Jesus Christ, it's necessary that he be eternal. Either that, or his work on the cross and was in vain. Now, we're also going on the assu um, assumption that you understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And I'll say this again. Because this, what we're saying now, is that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And so we're dealing with God the Son. So we're going to focus our attention on God the Son. We're not going to you know, ignore the, the Spirit and the Father, but we'll keep bringing them up to relate back to Christ himself. Now this was, you know, Jesus Christ asked people, you know, what think, you know, he said, what think you of Christ? Whose son is he? Who do men say that I am? Who do men say that, this, you know, that I am? The son of man. So who is Jesus Christ? And that's the focal point of the world because God set Jesus Christ up as Savior of all mankind. Not just those in America or any nation where they have Bibles, but the salvation of all mankind. And therefore, we're going to focus all of this on Him. Now, let's start with uh, looking at some major passages on His pre-existence. Let's begin in the... Uh, book of Micah. Book of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah 5, 2. Bethlehem, Capra, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, we know that, most of us, that this is a prophecy of the birth of Christ, that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And the statement here is that his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, from eternal. So the statement is that there is no beginning here. That this person who is to be born in Bethlehem is eternal. I wonder, I sometimes I wonder what like Micah would thought, you know, or these guys thought, you know, well someone's gonna be born into eternity from you know, into a finite world from an infinite. And I, I, you can see how the, a lot of times how maybe the, uh, a lot of the confusion has risen from the, scri or from the scribes and Pharisees. Let's look at another Old Testament scripture. In Isaiah chapter 2, or chapter 9. prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ, and uh, a very popular one, and, and probably a lot of you have it memorized, it says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and righteousness. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we have, unto us a child is born, indicating that there's going to be a birth of a child. A son is given. The son of God is given to us as a gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So a son was given to us. And, and you start looking at these, these titles here, Wonderful and Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And I think, and think back to those statements uh, that Schaefer made, you know, that, that he's called Wonderful, yet, yet he spit on him, and Counselor, yet he was rejected of men. Uh, the words at the everlasting father, uh, Walter said that the literal translation of that is um, uh, father of eternity. So, and I thought that was really interesting. Cause I, I, but, so here he's attributing not only that he is the mighty God, but the father of eternity. Now, no one is that but God himself. Yet, who was born in Bethlehem? who is the Son and said he was sent to the world. Jesus Christ. And it says that he have no end in his government. Now let's look at another, let's go to the New Testament. In uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. This is probably the most powerful statement, the most conclusive statement on the pre-existence of Jesus Christ and maybe on the beauty himself. John beginning his gospel, and it appears that in his purpose in writing this gospel was that he wanted to show the deity of Jesus Christ. He wanted to show that Jesus Christ was God. So he starts out his statement like this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay. So what we have here is a statement that the Word or the Word Logos is an expression, and that Jesus Christ is an expression of God. He's not, you know, um, it's, he's not some created being. He's the eternal expression of God, and that and it says in the beginning, and the word, the words here deal with that when the beginning already was, he was here. Not that in the beginning, now we have the word but that the, world that the Word existed from eternity. He goes on, he says that the Word was with God, expressing the separation between God and the Word, that there was, a, there was a definite distinction here between God and the Word, and the Word was God. So then he ties it back together, that the Word himself was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. So you have... You have the whole setup here of the distinction of the Word of God, yet that the Word of God and God were the same, the eternal, eternally the same. He says, all things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made that was made. So it also places the Son as the Father of creation. Now, in other verses in the Bible, in uh, we can, uh, we'll look at those a little bit later, uh, such as in Colossians. It also attributes that Jesus Christ is being the creator and sustainer of all things. There's only one creator, and that's God himself. And here we have it again attributed that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. In fact, what would you... A, a, a creation, a thing, is a created being. And therefore, if Jesus Christ was created, he had to be a thing, right? 
What's the distinction between the Messiah being the everlasting Father and the first person of the Trinity? Well, um, like Walter translated it literally, the Father of Eternity. So you think you think that's the distinction? That that yeah, I think that would be the distinction. I always. Uh, That's a little translation. I, I look, you know, from my sources. Any more questions? Okay. Um, so, anyways, that Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ was a created being, then he would have had to have been a thing, correct? And it says that all things were made by him. And without, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus Christ had to exist before all of creation. And if he existed before creation, then he had to be what? God. Self-created. That's right. Self-existing. And that's what the next statement says. In him was what? Not anything made that was made. Yeah, but in him was life. Life. In him was life. And that means, you see, we have life in us, but we don't, it's not ours to give or take. We don't possess life. It's in us. It's given to us. Jesus Christ had life in him, and he gave life. And that life is the light of men. Mike, would you expand just a little bit on what, on Don's comment? Jesus Christ was a self-creator? Is that what he said? I didn't understand. Well, I believe what he would so go ahead. I was just using his own argument. His argument was is that Jesus Christ, if he was the only creator, the only way he could be a created being would be a, would be a self-creator. Oh, and he's not obviously a self-creator because he's not a created being. Right. He created everything. So that's an argument I'd never heard before. What we, what, remember, keep in mind what we're dealing here with is the eternal pre-existence of Christ. And therefore, if Jesus Christ has existed from eternity, our minds don't comprehend eternity, okay? It's, it's like when I start thinking of the attributes of God, or like something like eternity. Okay, I can go 10 years, 30 years, 100 years, Revolutionary War, I can, Egyptians, you know, I can go back, maybe, I can... I, after I get to such large numbers, my mind, it just kind of goes like this. And my knowledge spreads out so thin and it's gone that I'm just floating. And this is where we come into faith. We've had enough information to channel us in the right way, to show us as much as we know anything in this life. I get so tired of people saying, you know, oh, it's blind faith. It's, you, don't, you know, how do you know God exists? How do you know Jesus Christ was God? Well, I got this. Well, how do you, you know... And it's, it's like, you know, when little kids always go, how come, why, why, you know, every question, you know, why. You come to a point where there's no more answers. But you can do that to anything that we know in this world. If you don't know all the answers, then you can get Just because we're dealing with the supernatural, people have, you know, all these different arguments. They put unfair bias against this. So as we're dealing with the eternity of Jesus Christ, there's going to come a point to where I cannot comprehend any further. My mind doesn't comprehend. But God has said that there is eternity and Jesus Christ is from eternity. So as we build this argument, if Jesus Christ is eternal, he has to be self-existent. He has to have life within himself. He has to be before all of creation. And here it states that he is the creator of all things. Okay, are there any more questions on that? Is it? Also in this, you can see um, in the first one, it says, in the beginning, was the word. Um, that word was implies a continued existence. Okay? A continued existence. And, and uh, that there was no certain set part of time. And so, and, and you go on, and you'll read, if you ever witness to a Jehovah Witness, you'll find out, if you use this verse, they'll go, and the word was a God, but it doesn't work. For one thing, it's, 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 trans, it's not even translated, it's an added word, and, and it's a lie. But on top of that, it does not fit in 
with the rest of the Bible. And here we're using the word God as the eternal God, the creator of all things. Okay. Now, let's look at another interesting uh, passage in 1 John. You'll also notice as you study, uh, we, we'll be using the deity of Christ, we'll be using a lot of John. And it's like I said, his main focus was showing that Jesus Christ was God. Now, in, uh, let's go on over to verse 15. And you have here John the Baptist proclaiming Jesus Christ and, uh, and making the way. He says in verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And he goes on and says, And of, of his fullness have all we received, and, uh, and grace for grace. And, and he starts talking of Christ. But in verse 15, do you notice something interesting? Is that he says, this is whom I spoke. He that comes after me was preferred before me. Now we can understand that. Okay, yes, here comes Jesus Christ. He, I'm leading the way, make straight the path, prepare the way. Here I am, Jesus Christ is coming after me. Now he's preferred before me because he's above me. He is the Messiah. But then he says, for he was before me. Now, that's not very good English. If he's trying to talk about preeminence or just a positional status, he'd say he is before me. <clears throat> Unless John the Baptist got promoted above Jesus, then he was before me. Stealing, the word was indicates a point in time Christ preceded John. Now, remember the story? Elizabeth was, I heard he went three to six months earlier had John three, six months before Jesus Christ. So John is probably six months older than Christ. So if Jesus Christ was to exist in a point of time before John, then that means he had to pre-exist as a person, as a being. Okay, you catch that? Do you understand that? Jesus Christ had to exist before his birth. Because Elizabeth conceived probably six months prior to Mary. We're talking the time, not rank and dignity, because he stated the rank and dignity just prior to this. He's preferred before me. Because he was before me. Because he was, that was, is that eternal pre existence of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. Heavy book. Heavy book. And in chapter 6 is a, a chapter that set many people towards the kingdom of God and drove many people away from the kingdom, or didn't drive them away from the kingdom, but forced them into a point of decision to where they turned and left them and followed them no more. And in here we have Jesus Christ We'll be dealing in from verse uh, 33 on picking out verses. Jesus Christ is describing where he came from. Now, why is that important? Jesus Christ is telling us where he came from. Because, you see, if Jesus Christ came anywhere else except from heaven, the only other place that he could have come from, would, you know, outside this earthly realm, would have been hell. And he's telling us where his origin is. But by telling us this origin, that it's from heaven, he is declaring himself to be pre-existent. And we'll see in a mighty way and uh, that he'll be declaring himself to be the eternal God. Now, Verse 33 in chapter 6 of the Gospel of John says, For the bread of God is down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now he's speaking of himself. Speaking of himself, declaring himself the bread of life. He says so. 
And uh, they said, Then said they unto him, Lord, nevermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. Now let's, we're going to go through it, and, and uh, I hope you know the context of, this, of the verse, because I don't have time to expound on the verse, but we're going to go through and pick out the place, some of the places where Jesus Christ claims that he came from heaven. And we can start with verse 38. I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So then he goes on, he says, he came down from heaven by the Father. The Father sent him from heaven. So we're not dealing with any other heavenly realm, but that which God himself is enthroned. This had to set the Jews off in some way or another. I came down from heaven. If I said that, I saw the guy that had the posters that was around the house. says, I went to heaven. And that <laughs> caught my eye. And I just said, that guy's a flake. You know, I mean, that's what I said in my heart right off the bat. I saw I went to heaven and talked to God. Well, sure you did. <laughs> but Jesus Christ said, I came from heaven. That is my source. That is where I am originally from. That's my home. He says, let's go on and then look at... Um, He, claimed, he declares himself uh, the manna from heaven. And in verse uh, 48, he says again, I am the bread of life. The Father to eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Uh, this is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I, sh I will give is my flesh, and I will give for the life of the world, which I will give for the life of the world. So, these are incredible statements. But again, he, once again, he says, he is the bread of life, and that this is the bread that came down from heaven. That men may eat or partake of it, and become one with it, and they might have life. Because outside of this bread of life, there is no life. Let's look over uh, to verse... Um, 58. Not to miss the hard point of doctrine, but that's not our point. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eats the bread shall live forever. So he's dealing with these things that it is this that he is the bread that lit, that gives life, eternal life. And he goes on and says that many of them uh, said this is a hard thing. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Many people could not understand. How, he went on earlier, he said that he must eat my body and, and drink my blood. And, um, and he goes on in verse, uh, let's look at verse 62, one more verse. What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? So, another statement. Not only am I from there, but what if you see me ascend back up to there where I previously was? Before a point in time. Before what point in time? Before he was standing here talking to them, telling them this? You know, was he in heaven the night before, like the guy who had the bulletin boards around town? You know, hey, I was in heaven 50 years ago or 20 years ago. Was Jesus Christ in heaven the week before? No. Before his life on this earth. You go back. The same thing. The, the, the first, and the, when we're talking to John the Baptist. He was before me. In point of time, how was he before him? In his existence, he was before him. Let's go ahead and look at um, John chapter 3, verse 13. John 3, famous, or he must be born again. It also indicates the source are not the source, but where Jesus Christ came from. And in 3.13 he says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. And you go to verse 31. And he says, He that comes from above is above all, and he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaks of earthly things. He that cometh from heaven is above all. 
And once again, he's declaring, John the Apostle is declaring Jesus Christ. His preeminence above, before, and his existence in time. In another part of the Gospel of John, in chapter 8, you have Jesus Christ in a very intense discussion with the Pharisees. You'll notice that, you know, Jesus Christ gets really hot sometimes. He gets really mad. But who does he get mad at? He doesn't get mad at the poor, dumb people who don't seem to understand after the fifth time he told them to do it this way or to be like this. Or don't you understand? I told you what the Father was like. He gets mad at the hypocrites and the fakes. The ones that say, here, I'm representing God and I'm representing a false God. And you know what happened with the Jews right out of Egypt when they made a false God, a false representation of God and said, hey, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Hey, they got serious trouble and a lot of them died for it. So, we know that God is extremely serious about who portrays him and how he's portrayed, right? And we also see that in Jesus Christ, that same attribute. How he's very serious. And when it, you know, we read the Pharisees and the Jews. When, it, when you read Pharisees and Jews, you're not talking about all the Jews. You're not talking about the whole Jewish nation because you see many of the disciples, they were Jews. He's dealing with the leaders and the faiths of that time. Now he says in, um, okay, so he's dealing with uh, who he is and Jesus Christ makes a statement in 49, verse 49, I have not a demon. They accuse him of having a demon. And uh, he says, I have not a demon, but I honor my Father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory, but the, but the one who seeks me, very, very, I send to you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead in the prophets, and you say, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets who are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Who do you say that you are? There is that question again. Who are you? Who do you think you are coming off like this, saying these things that, that you have eternal life, that you can give life, that you can give life to people who never die? If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. But you have not known him, and I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his sayings. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day, and saw it, and was glad. Now, this is where he makes an incredible statement. Not only earlier, like he said, he did eternal life. But he says that Abraham saw his day, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Have you seen it? Abraham, and Jesus said, Verily, verily, I said to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took, up, then took the up stones to cast them, and Jesus hid himself went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why are they going to stone him? Before Abraham was, I am. He saw my day and was glad. Who are you saying this? You're not 50 years old. Before Abraham was, I am. Back in the book of Exodus, God gave Moses his name. He told him his name. You know what his name was? Yeah. Let's look back there. Let's take a quick look at the book of Exodus chapter 3. We'll be going back to that in a little bit. Exodus chapter 3, Moses on the far side of the desert, kind of taking a retreat from Egypt and he's tending sheep and God gets his attention. A bush is burning and he says, um, let's go on over, we'll read another part of it later, the earlier part of the chapter, but let's go to verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come to the children of Israel, now, he told Moses to go back to Egypt and take the children of Israel out. 
Moses has a real complex and self, you know, personal low self-esteem, and he's really worried about this, and then, you know, he's afraid they're going to reject him again. You know, they didn't like him in the first place. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come to the children of Israel, and they say, and, and sh Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your father has sent me unto you, and they, sh they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, have sent me unto you. So God says, this is who you're going to say has sent you. I am. Now Jesus Christ, back here in 858, says, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that's the eternal I am. That's the name of God. That's the signature of an uncreated, continual, eternal existence. I am that I am. There is no beginning. There is no end. That is God's name. And therefore, not only was he, was he existent before Abraham, but that from eternity I have existed. He didn't use the words, before Abraham was, I was. Once again, we say, well, this is terrible grammar that Jesus Christ used. But it's not. He used exactly, has done in this book, exactly what he meant, exactly what he wanted. And so he took the name of God. And by using the words, I am, he, he talks all forms of language that could accommodate the fact or the belief that he was a mere creature of God. He did not allow for that. He did not allow them to make any sort of judgment or any sort of belief, I mean, any form of belief from what he said, that he was a created being. You know, and one other thing about this too, is if you still have problems, why did they pick up stones to stone him just because he said something that was bad English? Why were they going to kill him? Why? Because he blasphemed according to them. If he was not God and he took the name of God, that was a holy, sacred name. You know, we, especially in America, you know, I, was in, I don't know what the Japanese and the Chinese said for various words, but I never heard the Filipino people use God's name nor Jesus' name as cursing. Never. Not once. Especially here in America. We use that word a lot. And we curse with his name. And we throw it around. Oh, you know, chew. Oh, God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. The Jews revered his name. It was holy. It was, and so when Jesus Christ took this name and not only said it, but he applied it to himself. They took up stones to throw at him because he had blasphemed the name of God. As we keep going, as I, as I studied this, and, and last time I did this class, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me how people, cults, come to full, uh, ideas that Jesus Christ was a created me. What we call, uh, a lot of it started with a man named Arius, back on 300, who came up with the doctrine that Jesus Christ was a created being. Now, he was pre-existent, but he was created at a point in time, and then came forth. And that's what you'll hear. It's, it's just a, you know, the Jehovah Witness doctrine is just a warmed over version of the Arian philosophy along with several other cults. Yet when you read the Bible in context, I heard uh, Victor Paul Werewell, the founder of The Way, who had a vision from God in 1948 or something, God told him, just like he told Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith and, and every other founder, that he was going to start the original church, that the church had failed. Um, That's my train of thought and all that. But the fact is, is that, that these guys all come up with these false beliefs on Jesus Christ and that his existence was not from eternity, but that he had it created, that he was created at a point in time. And they take, oh, Victor Paul Werewell took his statement on why Jesus Christ was not God. I heard him make a statement once that just that he's sitting on the right hand of God. And because he's sitting on the right hand of God, he cannot be God. Great. Great argument. You know, I mean, how can I do that? 
And his statement about anybody else that believed that Jesus Christ was God, that they were dumber than a dead jackass. And I thought, man, where do you come up with this? People are deceived. People believe so many lies. And that's another reason why it's so important for us to accurately know. You know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly, straightly, correctly, dividing the word of truth, not, mess, not, not putting in any of our own belief, studying and diligently applying ourselves to the word, that we know these things. Let's look at um, one more verse in John. And that's 17, chapter 17, verse 5. Here we have an unqualified declaration that he shared personally and rightfully the glory which belonged only to Deity, even before the world was. Now this is this goes this statement goes beyond, far beyond just his mere pre-existence. I shouldn't say mere pre-existence, but it goes far beyond the statement that he pre-existed. Because he's saying that he shared the glory rightfully and personally with God that only belonged to the Father. In uh, 17.5, the priestly prayer and Jesus Christ says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So the glory, you know, and who does God share his glory with? He didn't share it with anybody. God's glory all worship and honor and praise belong to God, the true God, and only Him. And He doesn't share it with any. I'd also like to um, leave the Gospel of John now and go to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Dealing with the topic, talking about Jesus Christ, um, talking about the motives of man, and us looking to each other, esteeming each other, helping each other. It says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So this is what we're talking about. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, to be equal with, uh, not thought it robbery, equal with God. Christ was by nature God, equal with God. And he took upon himself the nature of a man. But from eternity, he has been and is today God. You know, it's hard to think about this. I mean, you think about God walking on the earth. God walked on the earth. And there he was. He touched people. If, you know, if Jesus Christ walked in the room, you know, wow. He's walking on the earth. He touched, he talked, he lived, he laughed, he cried. That's, I can't hardly understand that. But you know what? It's at least it's hard for me to understand is that today there's a man in heaven. There's a, there's a man up there in heaven. Right there in the throne of God, there's a man in the body. I'm not sure exactly what he looks like. But he's there in heaven. Can you imagine? Yeah. How do you know that he's got a physical body and it doesn't have you know, a spirit ex existence and a spirit form like the Father? Because Jesus Christ physically resurrected from the dead and physically ascended into heaven. And he promised us a physical resurrected body like his. And so there at the right hand of God is a human, or a glorified Man. Not, and not we this. Like right? We'll be like him. That's how we're going to know. Let's see. It's one scripture that calls him the first fruits. So, but I'm just thinking in my mind now as we're talking on this big topic that you know here's God for eternity living without a human body, and then now at a point in time we don't know how to describe that point in time. We're right in the middle of somewhere now he's living in a human body in heaven. Yeah. Just forever and ever and ever and ever that way. That's it. And then a okay, human body now, in a short time on earth and now, forever and ever and ever and ever, and ever that way, he's yeah. going to be living in a human body that's been glorified. That's 
It's not, it's not something he's going to abandon here in the next million years. This is something that he has put into him as a part of him from eternity to from that point in time to eternity. I just find this is just things that I think about that I find incredibly um, inco incomprehensible. But I think it's important that we recognize this because this is what we're saying we believe. This is what we're saying that we believe. Yes. Uh, to add to what Daniel was saying, uh, in case it wasn't, I don't know, maybe it wasn't clear, but uh, First Corinthians 15, when I was going over that the other day, it makes a real strong distinction between the body that we have now and the glorified body. That, like, you know, John said in the first three, right. uh, there is a distinction. Oh, yeah. The physical body that he has is like the physical body that we carry around. But his resurrected body was recognizable, you know. And when we get to the resurrection, we'll just, you know. That's the hard part to grasp right now is the immutability of God. The fact that he doesn't right. change and the fact that on this particular issue, he, just, he changed. Man. He changed. He, he took on the form of a man. And he's going to keep that form for eternity. There'll be a constant identification with his people. And so there was a a change of sorts, if, if we must use that word. I mean, he went all eternity without a body up until this point. And from this point forward, there's a human body. And somehow that, that doesn't violate his immutability. It doesn't violate uh, the changing this. Margaret? Yeah. Um, God now has a, a human body. Um, then do we speak figuratively when we say that Christ sits at the right hand of God? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, we don't really know what heaven is like. You know, God himself, you know, in his spiritual nature doesn't have hands and feet. Yet we find the Bible describing, describing him with hands and feet. Uh, God is not constrained to a, a point, a, a space. God's not constrained to time nor space. Okay? Yeah. But we say God is in heaven on the throne. Um, so, somehow, in this description of Jesus Christ, and you can go into all sorts of analogies, the right hand being a symbol of power, the right hand being a symbol of the word, you know, people, most people work with their right hands, and there's a lot of analogies, but we got to be careful when we start, because we start trying to get pictures of God, you know, and if we've got pictures of God, you know, everything they described right here, he had hands, feet, wings, you know, feathers, and all sorts of things be wild. <laughs> it be pretty scary. Well, God the Father didn't cease to exist with the incarnation. Right. Right. That's yeah. That God, the Son, incorporated was was, in the, was the body, took into Him the body. Yet God the Father is still the Spirit. Is still in the spirit, spiritual sense. So when I stand before the throne, I'll see two entities. I don't imagine you might see three. Three, all right. You see right one, now one being, three persons. God the Father and God the Son. One will have a glorified body. Right. And the other one has whatever God has. Whatever, whatever God is, yes. Yeah. Okay. You see a golden streak right in front of you. That's, I like that. I, I, I've tried to picture it. You read Revelation describing the throne room and the cherubim crying one to another. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord. And, and as, as jewels set, and just and rainbows of light coming forth, emanating forth, and, and a tree of life and a water, water, you know, a water, water, river of life. Am I going to see a river with this tree? Is it going to be gold light, blue light, green light, and jewels? Is God going to be there? Is Jesus going to take me by the shoulder and go, come on, I'm going to show you a place. And, you know, where, you know, what is? I don't know, but I'm sure excited. I sure want to get there and find that. And, and I just, I wouldn't, you know, in my mind, in my hope, I have. A vague middle picture. I do. I will not allow myself to say this is what heaven's like. I know when I get there. Though some people will bear witness that I have said that you know when I get to heaven, my place is going to be mountains and streams and that sort of thing. But yet I don't tie that down. We've got to be careful about that. God is, you know. And so when we see God, when we're changed, I don't know what we'll see. 
I know if I saw him now, I'd surely die. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other uh, questions or statements? Elizabeth? Oh, no. <laughs> I was just gonna, I was just telling Paul that um, I talk about these things with the kindergartners. Yeah, they I try to explain. It's so interesting their ability to perceive yes. heavenly things. They ask about every day what happens when we die. And they ask real in-depth questions. It's really neat. Little little yeah, and I'm kind of like, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, well why don't we go ahead and take a break and uh, come on back a little bit later. Conclusion, some of these major scriptures that we covered, there's many others that you can address the pre-existence of Christ, the eternity of Jesus. And thus, if Jesus Christ is eternal, he must be God. There's no other option behind it. And that no, matter, no matter what form God may take, it doesn't make him any less God. For being in the form of God, God not rather being equal with God, but made himself with no reputation. And he's still God. Just like clay in the, in the field, put in made into a china cup, it's still clay, it's still the same basic elements. God is still God in Christ. Now, um, Fine. yes. Right. Are you going to be getting into it? Um, at this time, you can get into it. But uh, did Jesus exhibit all the attributes of God? We'll be dealing with that. Okay. Yes, we will address that, that Jesus Christ possesses the attributes of God. We'll be going through this discussion. We'll have, you know, we'll, we'll discuss, you know, was Jesus Christ omnipotent? Was Jesus Christ omnipresent? Is he omniscient? So we will we will address that at a later date. I don't think we'll get there tonight. No way. Okay, what I'd like to go into now and discuss is the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord you'll find throughout the Old Testament and numerous places, more than, many more than one. We will address several to get a feel for who this angel was. Was this a regular, was this one of the angels like Michael and Gabriel, or was this a special angel? And what was his purpose? Who, you know, who, was, who was this angel? And the line of thought we'll be covering, of course, would be that of Christ. And we will show that this angel is, was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Before Jesus Christ came as a human being, he appeared and as this angel. Now, in the Old Testament, you'll find several names for him. The angel of the Lord, the angel of God, the messenger, the angel of the covenant in Malachi. Let's start in the book of Genesis. Uh, chapter 16. Let's, let's go to Hagar. Abraham promised uh, a son. Couldn't wait. So Sarah says here, take the handmaid Sarah, uh, Hagar, the Egyptian woman. And so she, he went to her and she bore him a son, Ishmael. Things got tense and it just... You know, as, as uh, Hagar was, was, uh, had the, was carrying the child, and Sarah kicked her out. So let's look at, um, let's go to chapter 16, verse 7. Hagar is left, and in verse 7, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain on the way to Shur. Now, you also notice, once again, the, the letters L-O-R-D are all capital, implying that that being the word Yahweh, or the name of God, that the Jews had. 
So this is the angel of Yahweh. And um, he says, return to your mistress. The angel of the Lord said, return to your mistress and submit thyself in the hand. The angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Now, quick interesting statement here. Who's going to multiply her seed? The Lord. Now, what other angel has ever come and said that he would personally be responsible for a race of people and multiplying a race of people? Only, only one that's ever come and said that and done it has been God. This angel said, made that statement that, that he would take that task and, and he goes on, he says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, shall, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard, heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Oh, yeah. think, of, think what's going on in Lebanon today, in Syria, in Israel. Just think, it's so true. They, they're, they're wild over there. I talked to a, I have a friend at work who's from Lebanon, and he says, I'm really ashamed to even be called Lebanese. They are not humans over there. They have no respect for life. They just kill people. Because uh, I was talking to him about mission groups that go over there, and he goes, don't go over there. Whatever you do, don't go over there. He told me not to go to Minna now, too. <laughs> He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him. And she said, no matter who's speaking here, it's the angel of the Lord who's going to multiply her seed, and she called him by the name of the Lord. Who spoke unto her? Or, excuse me. And she called the name of the Lord, who, who spoke unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also here, have I also here seen him that sees me? So, Hagar, you go, well, this is just an Egyptian handmaid. Who is she to know? She called this angel God, but you know, the angel never, never did say anything about the angel refuting that title being attributed to him. Let's look at, um, look at another place in Genesis chapter 18. Uh, let's go to... Okay, now, Abraham meets the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go on to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22 is where Isaac is offered and then and, um, what we call a, a type, a beautiful typology of the sacrifice of the offering of Jesus Christ. God offering his own son. And in, the, in this chapter you, you see uh, a wonderful um, liking or a wonderful God telling that he was going to provide himself a sacrifice. Um, uh, some translations may say for himself, but it's like to argue that point. But any way you look at it, it's God making the statement that he would provide himself the sacrifice. Now, let's go to um, verse 1. And it came to pass, after these things, God did test Abraham. Now, Isaac was born, and he was no little kid. According to most people I've studied, said that Isaac was probably approximately 30 years old. Now, Abraham's approximately 130 years old. He had Isaac when he was 100, and Sarah was 90. You know, no spring chickens. And so now, here's this old 130-year-old man, and God's telling him to take his son. And he said, behold, and he says, okay, and God, God did test Abraham, and said unto Abraham, and, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, not Ishmael, Isaac, make it real clear. Because, you know, Abraham could have said, you know, take now thy son, thy only son, and, and uh, you know, do him in. Oh, I'll take Ishmael. We'll get that guy. Cause he says, Isaac, now in case there's still doubt, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer here, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, 
First of all, who made this statement? God. Who's testing Abraham? God. All right. Now, you can go on through the thing, and, and he rose up, and he cut the wood, and he goes, and he, and he gets there to the mountain, and he, and he has uh, Isaac carry up the wood. And an interesting statement, he says in verse 7, and, uh, I, and Isaac spoke to Abraham and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. The trust of the son and the father. And Abraham, it says in the New Testament, trusted that God would even raise him from the dead. His faith. And so they get up there on top of the mountain, and verse, and he, okay, he ties up Isaac. By now, you know, Isaac probably had a pretty good idea that he's going to be the sacrifice. And probably not really understanding exactly what he's doing, but he lays him upon the altar, and Abraham stretched forth, verse 10, his hand, and took the knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So God stopped Abraham. Or did God stop Abraham? Who stopped Abraham? Let's go back to verse uh, 11. And who? Angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord called to him from where? From out of heaven. Jesus Christ said he was from where? From heaven. And he said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, Abraham, don't lay your hand to the lad. He says, for now I know that you fear God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son. Now, you go back to verse 1, and you find that God was the one who told him to sacrifice. He says, withheld thy son, thy only son from who? He didn't say... Now, you didn't withhold your only son from God. He said, you didn't withhold your only son from me. You, you can't get around it. And there's, you know, unless you just have to ignore this statement, to ignore that the, the direct implications that this angel spoken of here in Genesis chapter 22 was God. Let's look at another interesting passage. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. Or forward to Exodus chapter 3. Now once again, Moses out of Egypt wandering around the desert tending sheep for 40 odd years and he's about ready to be used for the ministry. Great example, huh? Tired of wandering in the wilderness? <coughs> so, God, it's time for God to get, or, excuse me, to get Moses' attention. Now, Moses was at the top in Egypt. He was, you know, very possibly the next, you know, it's one of the top three in Egypt. And it was the, one of the leading powers in the world. He rich above all measure. And God couldn't use him there. He had to take him and, and humiliate him, get him down down to workable uh, size up in his head, not in his real position in the eyes of God. In his real position in the eyes of God, probably by this time, after tending sheep for 40 years, he was much higher on the status of usability for God. So uh, he says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and the, pri the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came <laughs> to a mountain of God, even to Horab. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he said, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will not turn my aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So you see how God's getting Moses' attention. Uh, you know, there's different types. You can see symbolism here in this, just the, the bush. And you, you, a lot of times assume that it's the thorn bush or the desert and burning and not consumed in a purifying fire of God, thorns being part of the curse. 
And you see, God gave Moses attention here by having this bush burning. Uh, sometimes God has to do some pretty incredible things to get our attention. And the Lord saw that, that he turned aside to see. And God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, draw not, draw not near and put off thy shoes from thy feet. And the place from which thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face and was afraid to look upon God. Now, we go back to verse 2. And we can go through this thing again. Who was in the flaming bush? Who was there? And the angel of the Lord. And then you keep going, and he says, I'm going to turn and look at this bush. And, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the midst of the bush. And so who talked to him out of the bush? God. Now, the angel of the Lord was, in, was there, was either in the consuming fire or was the consuming fire. Our Lord is a consuming fire. Our fire didn't consume the bush, but he spoke to him. And so there you have a direct, another direct analogy of the angel of the Lord as being called God. So either, you know, either you have to ignore these things or you have to directly identify this. Um, now, another thing to keep in mind is God did not permit any form of um, worship to be given to any other being except himself, correct? God only is to be worshipped. Uh, the angel in, in Revelation, and John saw him and was afraid. He fell down on his feet. And the angel said, you know, don't stand up. Worship God. I'm a fellow servant. So he identified himself as a fellow servant, just a, a messenger. And let's look at the book of Judges. We'll see that this angel received sacrifice of Gideon. You know, get, um, it says in verse 11 uh, in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, And there came an angel of the Lord, and he sat under an oath, which was an orphan, that, that pertained to Joash, the Evazite, and his son Gideon, Threshold, threshold wheat by the wine press, th or, excuse me, threshold wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And you go on and you have the, you know, the angel saying, the Lord saying, the mighty man of valor and, and the Lord be with you. And you're questioning all of that. But then you find uh, in verse, uh, as you go on down that in verse 18, he says, you know, don't depart till I come again. And he goes and gets a kid and makes ready a kid and gets a flower and, and he's going to make a sacrifice to this angel and the angel tells him in verse 20 to take it and to lay it on the rock and pour out the broth and, and the angel consumed it with his staff and it says in the end of verse 21 then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight so he offered he laid this on the rock the angel consumed it when it was consumed the angel disappeared departed out of his sight and he says in verse 22, And Gideon perceived that he, that he was an angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said, Peace be unto you, fear not, thou shalt not die. Now, two things here. One is that angel received the offering. It was the angel that received the offering. He made the offering to the angel. The other thing was, he was afraid he was going to die. Why? Because God told Moses, if any man sees me, he's going to die. Isaiah said, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. He knew he was in for it when he saw God in his glory. So Gideon knew these things. And he saw, when he saw the angel, he recognized that it was God. And uh, the angel received the offering. So either that was a bad angel or that was the Lord. <laughs> You have a King James, does it say an angel of the Lord? Yes. 
Sometimes that's the way it was translated. Uh, usually, and uh, I can't remember the exact argument, but usually it's always the angel of the Lord. What verse is that? The angel of the Lord? No, she's referring to well, all of them. Re- yeah, and, and Mine says, says, the King James, it says the angel of the Lord, which would designate, you know, just by rules of English, only one, which would represent Yeah, it usually, most always, he's it, called the angel of the Lord, and um, I'm not sure what the real translation is. We did research for it. Hey, you'd like to do that. Um, another one in Judges is you can, you can cross-reference uh, uh, Judges 13.18 with Isaiah 9.6. Judges 13.18 identifies you have Samson and, and the angel of the Lord coming and telling, talking to his parents. And, and, but anyways, it says, verse 18 of uh, chapter 13, And the angel of the Lord said unto them, Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is wonderful? Now, some translations have secret, the King O King James, but wonderful. Now, does that sound familiar? Jump to Isaiah 9 6. Who else is called wonderful? Jesus. Wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Father of eternity, the Prince of Peace. What? My guess. Um, it seems to be significant, maybe, that. that that Gideon could look at the angel, the angel of the Lord, and would not die. Yes. Whereas we've seen other cases, you know, where God came to Moses and said, you know, you see part of my glory, but you can't look at my face or you're going to die. And and yet we saw, Je- you know, men could see Jesus and not die. He was here. Is there any significance to that at all? Or just a coincidence? I know, you know, God would bend the rules and say, oh, okay, you won't die, you know, to this guy. If you look at me, you're going to die. So I, I think you know, there seems to be something there, but I'm not sure what it is. Or is there a place in the Bible that someone did die because they saw God? I don't know. But, well, but, 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 but the fact is, is that God did say that. God did say, yeah. If, if, if no man can see me and he'll die. Yeah, he uh, you can't see God face to face in our corruption. We, would, we, can't, we cannot exist in purity. Um, there are several places, you know, uh, the, man can see the glory of God and man can see, uh, man saw the spirit, the sin, as a dove. Man heard the voice of God speak as Jesus Christ. They heard the voice of God thundering in the mountains. There's manifestations or, or ways that God has made himself visible physically and, you know, in, to our senses. He's made himself real to our senses in ways that he's chosen. And I'm not sure in my limited studies that I really understand what, how he did it or why he chose what he did. But you'll find that Jesus Christ or you know, the, the, the glory, of, you know, the, when the glory came into the temple, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon's temple, you know, it drove them out, yet didn't kill them. You know, Moses saw God, but he saw what? The backside of God. Uh, what was that? Well, I'm not sure what the hell was. Uh, uh, you know, just some sparks coming off the rocks, or, you know, a glow, or, mm, you know, the wind was blowing, and he kind of got singed or something. You know. What was it? I, I don't know. But we know that we cannot see God in his total... We cannot stand before the throne and look at the triune God. But God has chosen in some way, for some reason, to show us I mean, physical, visible manifestations of the Spirit, tongues of fire, as a dove, or as tongues of fire, something that looks similar to light as. Um, but I don't know. I really don't understand why he chose, but he did. And the same thing with Jesus. Jesus Christ, totally God, yet the second person of the triune God. But in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bottle. So uh, I don't understand that. But I, do, but I know that God could neither present himself here before us in this life, nor could we go to be before him in the throne room, wherever that is, and live.
other questions? Okay. Um, another verse I'd like to look at is uh, Malachi chapter 3. He says, and this is like a prophetic statement of Jesus Christ's forerunner, John the Baptist, who says in verse 1 in chapter 3 of Malachi, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he, will, he, and he shall prepare a way before me. And the Lord whom you, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, so, he says, I will send my messenger and prepare the way of the, and, and, uh, before me, and the Lord, whom you shall seek, shall suddenly come. Even the messenger of the covenant, the word messenger is the same word as angel, and that's speaking of Jesus Christ. That John is going to go before him, proclaim the way, and that the messenger of the covenant, Jesus Christ, a new thing, you know, is spoken unto you. Just a new, a new covenant of love, of sacrifice, of the grace of God, a God of mercy that comes and actually became a kinsman redeemer, part of the family. Mike, so, is this actually the same word as translated angel in other portions, or? Yes, that's what. I, yeah. Okay. Is it the same word as translated messenger in the first part of this? I think it is. Reference to John the Baptist. I think it is. Same word both places. Because angel means, you know, lesson or one of sin. So, Jesus Christ being sent the messenger of the covenant as the messenger of the covenant. Again, we have another relationship. And there's others. There's, there's a lot of other verses um, that you can find. The Kings, Judges, Chronicles, Psalms, like, you know, the book of Isaiah. Yes, Don? You know, just thinking about this, what we've been talking about, when we use the word uh, angel and messenger, and I have never really, I've heard the argument before about <clears throat> the reason we didn't die when we saw God was because God always appeared in somewhat of a human form, you know, the angel to uh, Gideon and to Manoah and, you know, just many uh, to Abraham at that time. They were all like men, and that's why they weren't freaked out even, because they were like men. But then you brought up some interesting points. Well, there were also tongues of fire and uh, burning bush. It was the angel of the Lord. But um, if we just take it logically and say, well, it's a messenger of God or one who is sent by God, it's only a partial manifestation. Every single time it's a partial manifestation. If it's only a partial manifestation of you know, the bigger, well, that's why we don't die. Because we're not seeing God, we're seeing. Yeah, we're just seeing a, a small piece or whatever. He, you know, I'm gonna let you see a fire. I'm gonna let you see this. I'm gonna let you see that. And when you brought all those together, it, it was pretty heavy to think that God has manifested Himself in all those different forms and fashions, and nobody's died because those were only forms and fashions. They weren't. They weren't really God. All right. You know, so they weren't all fully God. They, they yeah, they, they weren't, weren't all, yeah. you know, yeah. well, like you said, though, Jesus Christ was fully God, but that left out the Spirit and the Father. There was something. So yeah. when you're understanding yeah. the Trinity, we try. Right. Yeah, we there can. There was something there that had to be left. Yeah, when he the came. full glory of the Father. Um, Who would have been going around vaporizing people. Yeah. Where <laughs> from? <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, each of those manifestations of God, Christ, the angel of the Lord, or what Moses saw in the mountain, were totally God. You know, it, it's the, it, you know, it like he changed his form, but he was still God. And so it's like the idea with the clay. You know, the difference between a spade and a sword that are made of the same material. They're both made of iron, yet it, it was the molding process in the end. Okay, well then how do we make the complete tie-in that all of these manifestations, and we said the ones in Acts were the Holy Spirit, but it's been many people's conjecture that those of the Old Testament, you know, the one to Abraham, the one to Manoah, the one to Gideon, were in fact Jesus Christ. How do we make that tie-in, and where's the scriptures that would say that specifically? That these were that Jesus Christ. those angels of the Lord were Jesus Christ. Mm. Or, or is there any? And that's not a trick question. I really want to yeah, um, it's a good one. You know, okay. Ken? Well, I'm just, uh, 
the way I've always taken that is just the, the reference to Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, the burning bush, I just, I've never thought about that before tonight. But as far as the theophanies in the Old Testament, it's just the second person of the Trinity is God manifesting in the flesh. So that's why I say, so when we talk about the men, you know, that that's saw that's Abraham, the Abraham you, know, the angel, you know, that that could have been God manifest in the flesh. Uh -huh. Jesus, that's, uh -huh. that's stretching a bit. Uh -huh. Uh, but that's how we have. They could have done that way. They have to be born. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Also, the, the role that the angel always played uh, appears to be one of the redeemer, the messenger. And like what we just, you know, right, right here in, 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 in uh, Malachi 3, you know, the messenger of the covenant. And that, that was Jesus Christ's role and his preparation of the way. Um, And just the roles that, that seem to be the way that the Godhead has seemed to delegate the responsibilities of being God and of Jesus Christ being the messenger of the covenant and the, the redeemer, the one who came and died. And, uh, and then the, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the communication with God and the teaching and the guidance, the continual guidance by the Spirit. And, uh, this is still somewhat loose then. It's, I don't, in my, in, I, I've looked at this, yeah, I don't think, for one thing, there's no way you can tie down God and say, Jesus Christ's role was creator and redeemer, and the Holy Spirit's role was teacher, but, well, the Holy Spirit's role was creator too, yeah, right, and, you know, and it was the Holy Spirit that, you know, was involved with the sacrifice of death of Christ, and it was God's blood, it says, in, in you know, Acts 20, that was shed on the cross, and, and you know you, you can't but we're trying, to prove, a, we're trying to prove a point here we're trying to prove Jesus deity by his pre-existence and we're using angel of the Lord as a representation of Jesus to prove his pre-existence and now that we've come full circle we're, we're having a rough time guaranteeing that the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ thereby proving his pre-existence thereby proving his deity well we've proven that well the, the angel of the Lord is a person and We've also shown as God. that as God, as a person, as God. Um, and we've also shown a, a, his role is, is, represent, is a representation of God. And like when, the, when they came and they met Abraham before they went to, uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel, the, the one, the, the spokesman, which many believe is Christ, and, and coming and giving the message of, you know, hey, judgment's coming, and, and you know, and you can keep looking at the different roles and stuff. And I often and I I keep thinking there's a there is some New Testament scripture that uh, there's at least one or two, but I can't think of any offhand that would relate directly tie this in. John eight. John eight. Just that the eternal preexistence. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Abraham rejoiced to see the day of Christ. Yeah, I don't think he's mm -hmm. talking about seeing Christ himself. Um, what about the one that just did where he said, I am, you know, and came out with I am? Right. He, he claimed to be, yeah, that we have that tied down that Jesus Christ okay, is definitely. Uh, where Jesus is, I yeah, am. That, more, that when, you know, not agree with the King James, the mm -hmm. King James, but I've got a new King James, okay? And in all ways, says the angel of the Lord is like him, which is the one we did, uh, the whole I sent my messenger, okay? But then it goes down and it talks about the messenger of the covenant. And the being a determinative who is one. And if it was a messenger or an messenger, then that would mean that there'd be a bunch of them and he just chose one. So we narrow it down to the little determinative the, and it can only be one. So who else could be the messenger of the covenant? Other than God, or yeah. the angel of the Lord, right. other than Jesus. Yeah. yeah, eschatologically too, the day of the Lord, and that seems to be some statements in here too. You know, the day of the Lord, the refiner's fire and fuller soap and all that is not just His work on the cross, in my opinion. Right. Right. I teach the same scripture eschatologically as the day of the Lord, which will happen later. We know that Jesus Christ is definitely the author of the day of the Lord, and the one that will execute judgment. Those are some real slim tie-ins, though, but they are well, slim. Yeah. They're the tie-ins. I'll accept them. We've got this, the continued, I guess what we could also say, the progressive revelation throughout. You know, at first, you know, Abraham, I don't, 
know if he really knew that, okay, this is Jesus Christ, you know, and he's going to die on the cross. I don't know if he really But he didn't know it was God. But he recognized it was being God. Yeah. Plus, don't you think that it is so crystal clear because it is one of the great mysteries and God didn't want to put it in the box here, the box there. It's possible. But we're trying to prove something. We're trying to make a theological proof of the pre-existence there by the deity of Christ. And, we, and you know, like he said in our introduction, if we can't point to scripture and say, well, here's why I believe in the deity of Christ. There's, is that, there's a scripture in there that attributes Jesus Christ as being in the New Testament, the flame that went uh, in the desert, the light in the desert. Uh, I think it's um, 1 Corinthians 10 or Romans 10. These things are examples. The drink of the spiritual rock, the rock of Christ. This, um, is means I am. Yeah, I can't. I can't find it. But I was thinking there was a scripture in the New Testament that that attributed Christ as being the, the light and the wilderness of the flame that went before them. But um, I can't okay. find it. I'll look it up. Maybe next week. Well, the strongest one is the I am. Yeah. scripture, you know, before Abraham was, that, that's obviously Jesus talking and attributing himself to God, who was the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. That's the strongest using one. His name. Yeah, using his name, the only name that can be used by God. Yeah. So that's the strongest direct scripture that shows pre-existence, that shows Jesus claiming it, and, and then you go back to Exodus and follow through. It. Yeah. But with a non-believer, that's yeah, if they don't Still, believe the Bible anyway. With the point of well, that you're talking about Jesus is God, because otherwise they say, say well, so not. Yeah, well, I am. Usually with a non-believer, you're not going to take them straight to the argument no, of the angel. Or <laughs> or the, uh, yeah. But you were talking about him. Yeah, right. It, it is. You, and someday you may have to you know, make that defense. Very good. Okay, we're going to enter in the next topic, which we will not complete tonight, continuing the discussion of the deity of Christ. His name. Now there's, there's a large number of names and titles and descriptive designations of, of Christ and we'll cover some major ones and what you may, you know, then there's other ones that are very good to, to cover but we won't have time to cover all of them. There's names relating to his incarnation, his redemptive work, um, his relationships with man, who he is. So we'll, uh, Let's start with um, Well, for example, you can start with Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and start with this. Earth name. Jesus Christ, the word Lord, and basically dealing with his authority. The word, word kurios, the Greek word, which is the word that was used to translate the word in all capital Lord, sometimes is used for, for people in high power. It, you know, Moses was called Lord by uh, Sarah, you know, and other people, but the, the, the way that the title is attributed to Jesus Christ doesn't leave room 
for that. And in fact, you know, many of the New Testament writers knew very well what they were doing when they used a title such as Lord for Jesus. Um, one, uh, several uh, studies I've done have pointed out that the Caesars in the day would only allow themselves to be called this title when they were requiring themselves to be worshipped as deity. And so, you know, so for, for Paul to say the Lord Jesus Christ to a, a Roman emperor, Nero, that's, you know, that's a pretty strong statement. It's like, you know, almost as strong as Jesus Christ saying, I am, to the Jewish leaders. Um, the name Jesus, Jehoshua, Jehovah saves, God saves. And that speaks of the salvation, the redemptive work in Christ his title, the Anointed One of God, the Messiah. Now let's look at another. We can look at Jesus Christ being called God. Jesus Christ is called God in the New Testament and the Old Testament through comparisons. And we can... Um, well, since we've already talked about it, we'll just refer back to Isaiah 9.6, dealing with a child being born, a son being given, his name being Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. And uh, you know, some people might enter into, well, it's not the Almighty God. Yes, it is the Almighty God, the Father of Eternity. And so you have Jesus Christ, and that's being a direct statement, a prophecy of the birth of Christ. And not many people will argue that. So, Jesus Christ being attributed in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9, 6. Um, let's, let's do a comparison here. Let's go to Isaiah 40. We'll compare Isaiah 40 and Luke chapter 3. Isaiah 40, verse 3, once again, we're dealing with John the Baptist and his mission. And what is his mission? Well, who is he? He is the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert the highway of our Elohim. Okay? Prepare ye the way of Yahweh of the Lord. And make straight in the desert the highway of our God, our Elohim. And then you go to Luke chapter 3, and what's it say that uh, John the Baptist is doing? He's doing just what he was supposed to. Good guy that he is. He says, and as it is written in the book of Isaiah, so you know you don't have to worry about well, was this some other you know, where this come from? Book of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying will us pray the way of the Lord and make straight, make his path straight. And what's John doing? He's out there proclaiming Jesus Christ. He's out there as a forerunner of Christ. So here you have an, an interrelation between a statement made in the Old Testament and then the actual event occurring in the New Testament. Now, another, uh, another one which is, I find interesting is uh, talking about the appearing of our great God and Savior in the book of Titus. If you'd like to turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. We'll be doing some one-liners here for a little bit. If you'd like to just write them down and find that easier, you're, uh, you're free to do that. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, just says this. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the Greek word and is, can also be translated even. Even if, you left, even if you left and in there. There's appearing of our great God and, or even our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's look at another, just a plain old blanket statement. Acts 20, 28. Whose blood was shed on the cross? Who died on the cross? Jesus Christ, right? It's important. 20, 28, the book of Acts says just this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, he who? He God, he's referring to God. Purchased with his own blood. Whose blood? God. Who died on the cross? Jesus. Mike? 
Should a T be capitalized? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes capitalization is, is stuff that's up to translators. And some translations do translate as a capital. Yes? That verse can be translated. The reason it's not capitalized is because it can also be translated as the blood of his own. So it's not generally used to Oh, really? Okay. Well, it can be. It yeah. can be. But if you throw that to JW, they turn around and say, well, that could just be the transfer. Blood is on the sun. Blood is on the sun. Mm. Okay. And then another one that we can look at is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Attributing, we're talking about attributing Jesus Christ to the title of God. Hebrews chapter 8, making reference uh, back to the Psalms. Uh, yeah, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 8. But he saith unto the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness and a scepter of thy kingdom. And uh, so what he does here is he attributes the title of God to the Son, and the Son being Christ. And if you go on in the verse, he says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the, with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And you go away. You know, either God's talking to himself, dumping oil, and anointing himself with oil of gladness, or, or there's two people here that are both titled God, two persons that are titled God. And uh, one more, and this I leave this for the last as far as the statement of Jesus Christ's title of God, is because it was directly stated to him. John 20, 28. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen from the dead, appears to the disciples once. He, uh, Thomas was not there. He comes back later when Christ wasn't, does not believe. He says, I believe, I see you. You know, put my hand in the nails, holes in, in his side. And, so Jesus Christ comes back to him. He appears. I always like what Jesus Christ says. The first thing he usually says in his post-resurrection appearances is, peace be unto you. You could imagine the excitement or maybe even the fear that they'd feel. Uh, so anyways, he says, peace be unto you. He appears, and Thomas was there. And, and he said to Thomas, reach here, that finger, and he hold my hands, reach, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, you know, Jesus Christ didn't say to Peter, Now, Peter, you're rather emotional tonight. And why don't you settle down? Don't. A good angel said, Don't worship me, worship God. Yet Jesus Christ allowed himself to be called. Lord and God right there by one of the apostles and he received it he went on to tell Thomas you know that he's you know has seen and believed that blessed are those of us who haven't seen and yet believed so and there's other places you can find in Romans and Ephesians and other places where you can find directly a blanket statement just plain as day or even some general text that would uh, allude to that the title of God is attributed to Jesus Christ. Another word we'll look at real quick here is the word logos, which are word of God. And we discussed this a little earlier in the book of John in chapter 1 where it says, okay, in the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God, so the Word was God. Now, who, who is the Word? And what? Well, you go back to verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word became flesh, and He was the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
No man's full of grace and no man's full of truth. Not even the best of us were full of deceitfulness and wickedness. So, and, uh, so here you have that, that statement. And you can also take the title here that he also used, The Only Begotten. The only begotten. And uh, that, that in itself indicates the eternal relationship between the Father and the Son as opposed to a created Son of God. You have sons of God. There's other sons of God, right? We're called sons of God in certain places in the Bible. The angels are called sons of God. If you go to the book of Job, other places, you find that there's other sons of God, but there's a definite distinction. Because here, he says, the only begotten. And when you get to the word beget, and we'll discuss that a little more in length uh, next class when we deal with the Son of God, Son of Man title. But just keep in mind, you beget one of the same kind. A bird begets a bird. A fish begets a fish. A man begets a man. A man does not beget a bird, or a bird does not beget a horse. And, and therefore, God begets Good. I'm afraid you guys might have not followed the thought. Mike, yes. How would you respond to uh, Armstrong's argument that uh, God is like the family name of deity, and Jesus being the first offspring would therefore be God, and that what all the other references about there being many sons of God and, and so on is what we will be in the end, and that right now there's only God and His Son in the family of God, the Father and the Son in the family of God. But, you know, in the end, when whatever happens, happens, then there'll be many sons. Well, I guess the, right off the top, I just I would pursue a distinction between the eternal existence of Christ, and who he is, and the separation, the, 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 how, how Jesus Christ identified himself solely with the Father, and how he always made that distinction between his relationship with the Father and our relationship with the Father and that they are not the same thing and then never does he ever indicate anything different would ever occur throughout eternity that our position would be that of his that, that we'd be adopted into the family but uh, his position with the father was distinct and unique as compared to well he, he uh, his argument goes that okay, like your name is Parks if you have a son his name will right. be Parks but he'll still be your son he'll be your offspring and that Jesus was the offspring of God, but he bore his name, which was God. He bore the family name of God. And that eventually all of his children will bear the same family name through adoption. Yeah, I guess I don't follow his argument. I mean I see what he, I see that, but I don't I don't follow that. I like I said, the only thing that I would do is is I at least right off the top is just is indicate the um, the difference in the relationship that see Jesus Christ already had those things. And, you know, when he prayed in John 17, you know, Father, you know, glorify me now with the glory which I have with thee before the world was. Uh, well, he, he already had those things from eternity past. And, and we are entering into something that is being given to us as a gift. Uh, it wasn't a gift to Christ, but it's a gift to us. And, and our, our situation coming from sin, uh, I don't know, something along that line, it may not be a very persuasive argument for them, but that's, what, that's the way I would approach it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, why don't we go ahead and stop for tonight because the next arguments are going to get a lot longer and in-depth. I want to have you guys full attention next week. Tonight, in recap of what we've talked about, we discussed, and we are on the discussion of the deity of Christ. Jesus Christ has had an eternal pre-existence, has existed from eternity past, and will never cease to exist. And we got into some very interesting and good discussions, I felt, uh, over this topic of you know, who Jesus was and, and incorporating in his, in his, in the person of God, that person of God, a human body. That throughout scriptures we have 
many scriptures that, that identify the eternal existence of Christ, and then we use a, an example of the angel of the Lord as identifying Christ. And his pre-existence, not only his pre-existence, but his eternal existence um, as such. We discussed a couple of his names, and we'll go further next week, but we discussed the title, His Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and each one having a meaning, a title, a position. And then also that he was called God, the Logos, and that the Logos was the Word, and that the Word became flesh, and as the only begotten of the Father, and how each of those um, are all titles of Jesus Christ, and uh, indicate, if not show directly, his deity. Hopefully, when we're done with this, you know, you can culminate all this together in your mind and come to an understanding of what this means to you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that is the most important thing. Um, I'm going to give you homework. I hope I can write this so it's, it's a fairly simple one. Your homework will be hmm. I think I just got a word from the Lord to change the homework. <laughs> None. We didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, trust me. <laughs> Okay, what I'd like you to do is to list three major scriptures, and we went through many more than three tonight, and you can find some on your own, or if you'd like to uh, use the ones we did tonight, that's fine too. It's not a challenge to find new scriptures, but uh, it'd be, you know, if you want to do that, that's great. It'd be more for you. Um, list three major scriptures indicating the eternal pre-existence of Christ, and give a short statement as to how this shows his deity. Okay, you know, um, you know, John the Baptist in First John said, you know, that you know he was before me. Now, what? How does this indicate the time element? And that you know, by time, you know, give me a statement like that. Just a short, simple statement. That's all I'm asking. I don't want. I really rather not have big, long dissertations. But I will look at the homework. I do look at your homework, and even if I don't make comments. I look at it, sometimes I'll, I'll make comments and say something and check it off. I don't grade the homework. I don't give you a 20% or 50%, 100% homework. If you do the homework, you get credit for it. Um, I would encourage you to do the homework. You'll, you'll gain much more out of the class 
and the test of disruption very closely. Won't be the same question as the homework, but you'll do a lot better on the test if you do the homework. Um, are there any questions on the homework or anything that we discussed tonight that is clarifying? It's a distinction between the major and the minor. Mm -hmm. I know, I thought that when I was writing it up there. <laughs> All right. I wrote that and I thought, um, Inclusive and supportive. There you go. Inclusive and supportive. Three scriptures. Major or minor. <laughs> They're all pretty important. Okay. If there's no questions, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, we come before you again in a humbleness. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the privilege of investigating this topic of your Son. We thank you for just the, the abundance of evidence and proof, the reliable text that you've blessed us, and how even when we search things that our mind can't understand, there's nothing for us to fear just to enjoy the, the vastness, the, the incredible, infinite nature of your Son. And Father, I pray that you would help our minds to retain these things and to go even further and to apply ourselves to, to study and to commit ourselves most of all to you, Lord, that we would live a life that more than just our theology, our knowledge, and our words would speak of you, but our lives would be such a, a shining light, Lord. Just purify us and cleanse us. As we, go, as we grow to know your Son more and more, keep us until the next time. In Jesus' name we pray.